Hello everyone, I found this uh, problem online I wanted to tackle, and it's apparently from the 2019 Korean College Mathematics Competition, and it uh, is actually a pretty difficult problem. It's asking us to find this infinite sum, and at first glance, the thing you may think to do is to evaluate this integral first, and this integral actually isn't too difficult to evaluate because notice the derivative of this quantity in parentheses is exactly equal to this. So by u substitution, you'll get something like tangent inverse of that quantity over the square root of 3 or something like that. Something to that effect. And then you can evaluate that between the limits, 0 and n. And of course you'll get tangent inverse of uh, n squared plus n plus 3 all over the square root of 3 minus tangent inverse of 3 over radical 3. Which, by the way, uh, this is just radical 3 itself, and tangent inverse of radical 3 is, uh, I believe, pi over 3. So then that can be combined with pi over 6 in front, but we're subtracting this entire quantity, so it really gets added, actually. Look at that. And if you add those, you'll end up getting uh, pi over 2. So in fact, really, this is pi over 2. Again, uh, these two kind of combine after the double negative. So let me just actually get rid of the parentheses there to clean that up a bit. So those combine to pi over 2, and then we have minus that quantity. Um, this poses some issues because I still don't really know what to do from here. We still have this nasty sum. Sum of kind of a, I don't want to say a more complicated looking thing. It looks less complicated than the above thing with the integral, of course. Um, but at least the integral involved the rational function, whereas this involves tangent inverse. Now, I don't know about you, but in my experience, when you have sums involving tangent inverses, is most often, and the same can be said with actually ln as well, uh, it's most often going to be done by telescoping. And the reason for this is because there's actually an identity involving tangent inverse with differences. But if I'm solving this in a competition environment, I mean, I don't know, maybe studying for these kinds of things, you would just have those in your head off topic, like off top of your head. But um, I don't. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider if this was telescoping, then that means not only will this be of the form of something, let's say like a sub n plus 1 minus a sub n, or something to that effect. In fact, it could be even worse because it could differ by 2 instead of 1. In which case, it's like every other term telescoping, which is possible. Who knows? But assuming it's this type of telescoping, uh, that would actually carry over in the integral. So in other words, if you take derivatives of these things before the evaluation and then uh, kind of undo the evaluation from 0 to n back to x, then we'll end up getting is that the integrand is actually following a similar scheme for telescoping. So I'm actually going to erase all this. And let's try to see if we can set that up and go from here. And we'll find out something pretty interesting happening. So let me erase the highlights. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say suppose that this is actually equal to the difference of two functions, g of x plus 1 and g of x. Now, just thinking about this for a second, it has to be the case that these are fractions where the denominators are uh, polynomials. Because, of course, the denominator here is a polynomial. And in fact, notice it's a degree 4 polynomial. So this is going to be some numerator. I'm not sure what it is yet. In fact, I'll just call it a of x for right now. And I'll call the denominator p of x, which I know has to be a, um, well, it's a polynomial. We'll discuss what the degree is in a moment. And this, of course, will be a of x plus 1 over p of x plus 1. But notice when you subtract these, clearly they're going to be completely different. In fact, they probably will not, not really have anything in common. Um, in fact, they hardly ever do. If you have a polynomial replace x with x plus 1s, they won't really ever have any common factor. I mean, it could possibly happen, I suppose, but I don't want to think about that too much. What I want to think about is that if we were just combining these, assuming the product has no, or assuming these two things don't have any common factors, and the common denominator of this difference would be the product of these two. Okay, And moreover, if their product is a degree 4 polynomial, then they must, they must each be degree 2. In fact, notice the degrees both have to be the same anyways, because of, of course, 
replacing x with x plus 1 doesn't change the degree. It's still x to the same power. So the degree 2. And in fact, if they're degree 2 and they multiply it to that original denominator, then they must have a leading coefficient of 1. So that means we've actually stumbled upon a, a, a form for p of x. p of x must be of this form. So that means this thing must be x plus 1 all squared, which amounts to this, plus a times x plus 1, which if you distribute that, you get this, and then plus, uh, plus b still. That's just replacing all of the x's in p of x with x plus 1. Great. Okay, now what? Well, now we said that if we multiply this to p of x, we'll get the original denominator. And there's a lot of assumptions being taken here to see if this actually works out. But um, I think we'll be pretty happy with the result. Now, of course, we have to expand this out, which can be a little troublesome. But let me just tell you that if you ever have a uh, polynomial to a second power, you can just square each of the terms and then multiply each of the kind of um, pairs of two, two at a time, by, um, by, by two. So that product there is x to the third. x to the third times two is two x to the third. And then multiplying these two by two, the product of those two by two, you get six x to the second. And the last product of um, two that aren't the same are x and three. So it's three x, but that times two is six x. So that's a pattern that actually always works out when you have a polynomial to the second power. Score all of the terms and then multiply pairwise all of the different combinations of two multiplied and then multiplying those products by two. And then of course plus three. Now if we expand this, or not expand, I'm sorry, but combine this a little bit, we get uh, x to the fourth plus two x cubed plus the x squared combined to 7x squared, and then we have a single 6x and a 12. Okay. Now, I'm not actually going to expand the left side completely. Notice x squared times x squared is x to the fourth, so that's fine. But let's try to get the x to the third. So we notice we need x squared and x. That's the only way we can get x to the third from um, using that first term, x squared. So that's going to be ax uh, to the third. And then 2x times x squared will give us 2x to the third. We also have this ax times this x squared. That's going to be ax to the third. And is that it? I think that's it, because those are the only x's on that side. And yeah, that seems to work out. So in fact, notice these combine to 2a plus 2 all times x to the third. And of course, if we compare coefficients, this must be equal to this. And what's really great about that is that notice if 2a plus 2 is equal to 2, that means a must be 0, clearly, because 2a would be 0 divided by 2a is 0. So in fact, you can just really straight up just cancel um, cancel these things out. In fact, this term's gone. And uh, now what? Well, now I guess we can just continue foiling a little bit. In fact, um, what would the square term be? Let me actually lose these lines so it's easier to follow. So the square root term would be x squared times b, so it's bx squared. And then we have constant times x squared, and I guess we have x times x. So this x times this x, that's it for the x's. So that's going to be... Um, but notice, actually, that, that doesn't happen, right? Because <laughs> I missed that, actually, almost. A is 0, so that's fine. All right, so then what? Um, to get the next x squared, we have 1x squared and bx squared. So it's a 1x squared and a bx squared. And these, of course, combine to, you go back to green, 2b plus 1, all times x squared. So comparing this with the x squared coefficient, we get 2b plus 1 is equal to 7. That means 2b is equal to 7 minus 1, which is 6. Dividing by 2, we get b is equal to 3. So in fact, we have found out now that our polynomial, our denominator, must be x to the second plus 3. Perfect. Now we can talk turkey with the numerator. So 
Uh, let's try to write this over here. So we have something over x squared plus 2x plus 1 plus 3, which is plus 4. Okay, minus x to the second plus 3. And you know what's funny is that this kind of reminds me of partial fraction decomposition, if you've seen that before. So this minus doesn't really matter. So might as well write it as a plus, and then we'll kind of see what the coefficients end up being. And hopefully it will be, like I said, where the, the second one is negative, but you never know. And in fact, uh, moreover, notice our numerator here is uh, degree 1. So these, uh, these, these numerators actually are just, uh, are just constants. We can just call them a and b. They're not of x. And maybe that's not super obvious at first glance, but it definitely um, is the case because the x squares will cancel, so you only have x's remaining. So you don't need to multiply by anything larger than just a constant to make this combination happen. I mean, it could possibly be the case, but then you have higher degree terms canceling out, and it's kind of more of a mess. But let's just see if this works. So we get um, a times x squared plus 3 plus b times that quantity. Now, of course, we want the x squares to cancel, so that means a plus b better be 0. Okay, And uh, what else? We want the x terms to be 2 radical 3, if you distribute this radical 3 here. So what are the x terms here? So we don't have an x term from the first one, so that's fine. But here we just have it's just 2b. So that means 2b is equal to 2 radical 3. So that means b is equal to radical 3. And in fact, notice that means a must be negative radical 3, which uh, actually I'm okay with that. So let's just kind of see what that means. So, yes, yeah, so, so, so altogether we have this. We have g of x being equal to radical 3 over x squared plus 3. And what we have found out is our original integrand, which was um, radical 3 times quantity 2x plus 1 over x to the second plus x plus 3 all squared plus 3 is equal to then a negative the x plus 1 term plus this term. So really it's this thing we just discovered minus this. So in other words, it's actually the other way around. It was g of x minus g of x plus 1. So this is a kind of strategy you can use to find out um, what, like basically how to separate your weird function that you're summing over to kind of guarantee a type of telescoping. Now, of course, there were some assumptions we made along the way, but it definitely works out pretty nicely. So uh, one thing we can do is we can just call that, that function f. So let's call this function f of x. So we've discovered that f of x is equal to g of x minus g of x plus 1. Okay, from here, it's actually not that bad. We'll see the telescoping uh, work out. Um, so let's let's see if we can we can see this. But but notice um, our sum is still a little funny because we have pi over six still minus the integral from zero to n of that function, which again I called f of x dx. Okay, the good news is that we now know this is g of x minus uh, g of x plus one. But well, we would still need to integrate those, so really it would help to know the integral of g of x dx from 0 to n. Um, right, so this is radical 3 over x squared plus 3 dx from 0 to n. Now the antiderivative of this ends up being tangent inverse of x over radical 3. Now if you know the antiderivatives of... Um, of one, like 1 over x squared plus a, that's 1 over a tangent inverse, oh, I guess it's x squared plus a squared. It's this thing, I'll just write it out. So this is well known, this is 1 over a tangent inverse of um, x over a, or x over, yeah, yeah, a, because it's the square root of a squared, good. But notice here, um, a squared would be 3, so a is radical 3. So you'd get from this, you get 1 over radical 3 times tangent inverse of x over radical 3. But because of the radical 3 in the numerator, that'll cancel out with the 1 over radical 3 that comes out from this integration. So I hope that's okay to follow. Okay. 
And uh, there we go. So now with that being said, we need to do this evaluation, of course. Uh, but that's not too bad because notice when you plug in zero, tangent inverse of zero is just, well, uh, zero. So you get tangent inverse of n over radical 3. Perfect. So this sum, which is from uh, 1 to infinity, by the way, is then equal to pi over 6 minus the integral of g of x minus the integral of g of x plus 1. And of course, we can split that up So the first integral evaluated between 0 and n is tangent inverse of n over radical 3, just like we saw. Minus, so a little different, but when you um, evaluate the antiderivative of g of x plus 1 between n um, and 0, you get tangent inverse of n plus 1 over radical 3, not too surprising. But then minus, not 0, because it's not tangent inverse of 0 you get when you plug in 0 for this one. It would be tangent inverse of 0 plus 1, which is 1 over radical 3. Now, if you rationalize this, you'll get the familiar radical 3 over 3, which tangent of pi over 6 is this, so this is actually pi over 6. Okay. Which is great, because that will combine with the pi over 6 we had over there. And actually, how it combines, it's kind of hard to see with all these negatives, but it, they actually do cancel. So we distribute this negative here, it becomes positive, but then distributing this negative to that after the first distribution, it's kind of hard to follow, but it ends up becoming a negative. So we get pi over 6 minus tangent inverse of n over radical 3, uh, double negative there, so plus tangent inverse of n plus 1 over radical 3, and then triple negative, so it's negative pi over 6. Perfect. So these cancel, and look at that. We get exactly what I what I hoped for. We get this nice telescoping sum. Now, if you want to actually write this out, let me kind of rewrite it again, just so it looks a little nicer. So you have tangent inverse, and we're so close to the, the end, by the way. n plus 1 over radical 3 minus tangent inverse of n over radical 3. Wow. Okay. So if you actually wrote this out, you can see the telescoping happening. But it's pretty, I think, easy, easy to see, but I'll, I'll let you discover that on your own when you do the plugging in. But when you plug in 1, this will be 2 over radical 3 minus 1 over radical 3, the, the insides of tangents, of the tangent inverses. And then when you plug in, so let me just write that out. So you get 2 and then 1. So 2 minus 1. It's not, those aren't the actual numbers, but you know what I mean. And plus for the next one, plugging in 2, you get 3 minus 2. So tangent inverse of 2 over radical 3 will cancel out with this negative tangent inverse of 2 over radical 3. And if you keep doing it, you'll see the same pattern occur. When you plug in 3, you get plus 4 minus 2. Oh, uh, sorry, plus 4 minus 3. So then the 3s cancel and so on. So in fact, everything cancels up to infinity, but really you have to go up to the kth term to see this. And I'll let you kind of investigate that more, and if you don't really know too much about telescoping, this may come as a little bit of a surprise, but you'd have to technically write this as a, um, as a finite sum, as a partial sum. So we'll take the limit as k goes to infinity of that partial, the kth partial sum, and what ends up happening is the first term survives, which, um, actually not the, not the first term, but really the second term of the first term. So when n is equal to 1, you'll see that, because... When n is equal to 1, this is 2, which is the first term of the second term, if you know what I mean. The first part of the subtraction of the second term. So what ends up surviving after all that telescoping is negative tangent inverse of 1 over radical 3. And then for the last, um, the last bit that survives in the telescoping, the last final term would be the first part of subtraction of the last term. When n is equal to k, that would be tangent inverse of k plus 1 over radical 3. Now, if you don't believe me, you can actually write it out. I'm just going to be a little lazy here because obviously I've done a lot already and this video has become quite long. Uh, anyways, you can clearly see that as k goes to infinity, well, tangent inverse of infinity will be pi over 2 because tangent inverse has 
a horizontal asymptote at y equals pi over 2. So in the end, we just, well, we just get this. So uh, what is this? So we said already that the inside is uh, radical 3 over 3 if you rationalize, and uh, tangent of pi over 6 is that, so this is negative pi over 6. Perfect. So all, all together, we get pi over 2 minus uh, pi over 6, which is 4 pi over 12 or pi over 3, and that is the final answer. Very cool. So I thank you for sticking through this and uh, watching the video. Hope you all enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next one.